In order to turn it on, once again, hover your mouse at the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on closed captioning. Enjoy the webinar, everyone. Thanks a lot, Jackie. Um, hey, good morning, everybody. This is um, Ken from Tortoise Capital. It's uh, cold and drizzly here in Kansas, so perfect soccer weather, uh, perfect teaching weather. I'm really honored and pleased to be able to spend some time with you uh, today. Um, the slides are available for you uh, either from Jackie or from myself. You see my email. Uh, so if you didn't get access to the slides, you can go ahead and get them. So I'm going to uh, probably spend 30 minutes or so going through some uh, prepared slides, uh, but I want to preserve uh, at least 30 minutes for like questions and answers. And if you have any uh, questions along the way, just go ahead and drop them into chat. And uh, Jackie will um, make sure that I get to it. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, maybe the maybe the single biggest thing that I've learned this past year of COVID um, was the importance of relentless focus and relentless attention to detail. Uh, I probably take it to an extreme, but not really. Uh, you can see my my coffee cup there has my uh, little little turtle symbol there, slow but steady wins the race. And then also my favorite pattern, the um, supported spring crossing with the regression line crossover pattern, the price crossing the dragon. And that's sort of a visual reminder of um, taking care of the basics and staying with what I know and being very focused on what I'm doing. So that's, that's going to be a recurring theme today um, is the idea of uh, preparation and then follow through. We have a saying of frame your trades and then trade your frames. And the idea of um, uh, framing your trade is that we want to take standard templates like a carpenter or a mason or a craftsman, and we want to fit that to the general situation. We see what kind of work it needs to be done, pull out the appropriate uh, framing structure, frame the trades in our usual professional way, adjust it to fit the local circumstances, because there's always something special about that environment that we're in at that moment. But the basic frame gets us right into the ballpark and um, basically helps us pick the uh, the trade that we want to take is by putting the right frame around it. And then once we frame that trade and we've done all the prep work, then we trade the frame. And and we, that means that we're trading it according to the principles and best practices for that particular job. Uh, so this is a job. Uh, it's about going to work every day, being prepared, following through, taking care of your tools, treating the work with respect like a craftsman. Um, so that whole approach has been very valuable throughout the uh, COVID year. You know, we're on our um, coronaversary, I guess I saw somebody, somebody call it. So we've learned a lot. Uh, about this last year, about how to be flexible, how to be adaptive, how to seek out and then exploit new opportunities. Uh, some things haven't changed, other things have changed entirely altogether. So that makes it an interesting uh, day at work every day. So let's um, go ahead into it. Uh, I should say while we're there, the, uh, the tortoisecapital.net uh, link uh, the homepage has a bunch of free goodies for you that I think address some of the foundational principles we teach there for your use. The uh, patreon.com backslash Ken Long uh, is my subscription site, which I use for pushing out daily and weekly reports and case studies. And um, that keeps a running list of all the nightly strategy podcasts that we've been doing since uh uh, March 11th, 2020, we've done a daily strategy podcast every day. 
and the recordings are all located there. And then um, that's how I communicate to the um, to the world through that. Uh, and then the YouTube backslash Kennifer eight is um, my uh, YouTube channel for all the public and private videos I post. Um, most of the lessons that I do and a lot of the courses that I build uh, uh, just easily use YouTube, a uh, private channel for hosting the videos, but there's uh, there's probably 1,500 uh, public videos on there that address various aspects of our style of trading and case studies and psychological lessons and so forth, and I would invite you to uh, enjoy those. I apologize for the sound of my voice, but uh, you can only speak with what you've been given. All right. Um, this one is one of my favorite motivational uh, icons. These are my ancestors over in Wales, the Welsh coal miners from back in the 50s. And it looks like a tough, dirty, thankless job. It's a tough job. It's a dirty job, but it's not thankless. These are guys that loved what it was they do it. They saw it as an honorable profession and something they approached with craft work and it allowed them to put food on the table. And there was a very strong work ethic um, that comes to me from you know, my grandfather and my father, uh, whose favorite saying was that coal will not shovel itself. And that's the mentality that I try to bring to work every day and that is uh, get in there and do honest day's work. Um, and uh, so I've spent my whole life looking for hard work in order to uh, avoid it. So I know it when I see it, but uh, um, I try to bring this sense of craftsmanship and doing the job every day uh, in an honorable professional way to everything I do. So every time I start feeling sorry for myself or it gets a little hard, I remember what hard work really looks like, and that's that's what these guys remind me, three generations of coal miners. So, uh, the uh, Thanks to the Japanese philosophers and the Ikigai philosophy, um, when I talk to our uh, young officers here in the Army or my uh, high school soccer players and friends, we just, we're trying to find that sweet spot of finding the things that we're good at, that we love to do, that the world needs because we're adding value and we get paid for it in an honorable way. And when you can find that sweet spot, uh, a lot of the obstacles and the difficulties seem to melt away because you feel you're in the right place. And so checking that strategic fit between who I am and what I do and the world around me uh, is an important part of my uh, emotional well-being and satisfaction of doing a good job. Um, that's the zooming in on the, the coffee cup there, my favorite pattern on the left, and my reminder of what I'm all about on the right-hand side. Slow and steady wins the race, and that we're in it to win it, and that the results of our efforts uh, support the entire tribe. Uh, this is an example of a living sketch that we did. Uh, this one is from uh, May 15th, 2020. And the ideas were a coming together of the walking man, the true story roundabout, and the Shingo model of excellence. Um, there's a real synergy between these things. So the walking man on the left side there represents to me the five ways of knowing. And it takes, in my view, all five of those in order to be in this for the long run. Um, the head, the heart, the gut, the hands, and the feet. The knowledge of the head is the conceptual theoretical framework of the things that we're trying to do, the rational mind. But that's not all there is. There's the knowledge of the heart, and that is are the things I'm doing aligned with who I am on an identity and values level? Um, am I doing the right thing? And then the knowledge of the gut has to do with our evolutionary mind that is adapted to survive in a difficult world that looks for danger and experiences fear as a powerful motivator. 
and experiences greed because of millions of years of scarcity have conditioned us to get it when you can, store it as much as you can for the lean years. And so this emotional mind body that we've inherited is the foundations upon which our heart and head reside. So this knowledge of the gut is a powerful connection to the world around us. And so we're always getting signals that could conflict with who we feel we are and who we think we are and what we're trying to do. And we have to contend with that. And differences of opinion or tension between those three minds, head, heart, and gut, is the source of a lot of stress and cognitive dissonance and invariably finds its way into challenging work uh, as a trader and being able to deal with those inner voices and the feelings that we get when we're engaged in, uh, in trading, how we leverage that or resolve that and integrate that into our decision making is central to professional work. We have to accommodate that. Like, I don't believe we should be getting rid of those feelings of fear and greed, because first of all, I don't think you can unless you're a robot. And therefore, the energy of those feelings, I think, can be and should be channeled into productive work. There's really important information that you get when you sense fear and greed in the market through your own feelings. That's part of the herd mentality speaking to you. And so if you're feeling fear and greed, somebody else in that trade that you're in is also feeling fear and greed. The difference is you're not going to let that be your decision maker. You're going to use it as an important piece of information. You're going to integrate it into your decision making process. And you're going to be grateful for the energy and the insights that come from the knowledge of the gut. So let's embrace that and do something powerful and useful with it. Now, the knowledge of the hands comes next, and that's the craftsman's skill at doing professional work in a standard way and learning how to do work when situation is abnormal. So how do I do standard work during normal times? And how do I do standard work during abnormal times? And how do I distinguish between those two circumstances in the environment? So the know-how, the how to do it, how to put it into practice each and every time, that's the knowledge of the hand. And finally, the knowledge of the feet has to do with the life as journey concept that the act of trading is thousands and tens of thousands of repetitions of professional work. And you have to do that in good times and bad, when it's sunshiny and when it's rainy, when you don't feel your best or when you feel elated, you have to be able to operate in all seasons, in all weather, under all circumstances of knowing what to do. And so to be able to endure day after day, week after week, trade after trade, that persistence and resilience and endurance, that cardio fitness is part of knowing how to walk the walk and how to travel that distance. Um, so you're in it for the long haul. Uh, all five of those things, head, heart, gut, hands, and feet, those five ways of knowing, I believe, need to be integrated into your overall uh, trading strategy. Along our journey, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to spend time in roundabouts. That's that lower diagram. The, the R in the middle stands for all of the things that we do in a traffic circle. When we're in a trusted, safe space uh, with friends and allies, and we create a safe space, a trusted space so that we can tell each other the truth, and from that shared true story space in the roundabout, opportunities just naturally emerge. And it's an amazing experience. So in that roundabout, it's a place where we can rest, recover, reset, repurpose, re-energize, rehearse, reconnoiter. All of those things are happening in that virtuous circle of a roundabout. 
and then our journey through life through this mm, complex chaotic trading environment is a journey between these roundabouts and the good news is is that you can carry that with you at all times and when you feel the need to do any of those r words you create that roundabout space psychologically emotionally and practically and you do what you need to do until you're ready for the next stage of the journey uh, and so the principles of true storytelling the um, values of safety trust truth and opportunity inform our entire tortoise community of practice and um, that's been a really important feature of our community of uh, of traders in the last year when the normal human connections have not easily been there and it's very easy to have been feeling disconnected and distracted and isolated uh, and so being able to carry those qualities with us has been important well when the walking man in his roundabout meets the shingo model of excellence uh, there's a real natural synergy so the shingo model of excellence describes the culture and best practices of japanese manufacturing of enlightened manufacturing which starts with uh, guiding principles, which if you go clockwise, the guiding principles of who you are and what your objectives are aligns with the systems that you choose to operate to achieve those. And that those systems drive you to select particular tools to do the work in that system. And then those tools are your leverage when properly applied to help you achieve the results. And then the results that you get affirm the guiding principles that you stand for. And there's a virtuous circle as we get better and better as we go around that model uh, clockwise. But by the same token, when you go counterclockwise, those guiding principles end up driving the kinds of results that you get because your guiding principles are who you are and you shall reap what you sow. So your results are strongly connected to the guiding principles that shape all your decisions and your actions. And those results, when you study them and you analyze them, you do the assessment that allows you to refine the tools that you use, which helped you get those results. And then the way that you use the tools enable you to build and improve systems to achieve the results that you want. And then the systems of operation uh, drive the kinds of uh, uh, principles of who you are. So if you're, uh, you're if you're driving a car, if that's your system, then the way you drive that car ends up shaping who you are as a driver. Are you a courteous, cautious, safe, um, uh, kind driver that's mindful? Uh, so these uh, this dynamic Shingo model really informs the way we try to approach our daily trading practice in all things. And in the center of that, you notice these revolve around culture and behavior. And that culture is really the sum total of all the things that you do and you stand for every day. And it becomes a part of your identity and your place in the world. And that culture is shaped by the behaviors that you engage in. Culture can drive that behavior, but behavior as you do it reinforces that culture so there's a synergy between those two well this was a, a memorable day there on um, may 15th when these three bodies of knowledge kind of came together in a really important uh, synchronized integrated way um, to help me and our community of practice understand more clearly what it is we are doing and why we do the things the way we do them and i wanted to share that important uh, background with you because this is the the sense of craftsmanship that i try to bring to the work every day um yeah so this one the i'm going to shift to a concept called uh, that comes from adult education the uh, gradual release of responsibility model and this turns out to be uh, the centerpiece of my teaching practice, whether I'm teaching military officers here 
for the Army as I have for the last 20 years. The way I teach my, um, subor my subordinate coaches and my high school players how to play the beautiful game of soccer as I have for the last 20 years. Um, the way I teach in the doctoral and master's programs for management and strategy makers. Uh, and the way that I try to teach what I know about trading with others is the idea of um, empowering students to become co-creators of their own learning experience as soon as reasonably possible in order to help make them self-sufficient and self-directed and self-actualized. And in so doing, we have a mutual relationship of learning and teaching and studying together and so the teacher and the student are in a partnership to uncover what we can learn about the topics at hand. And so this gradual release of responsibility model is a systematic way of approaching the learning endeavor and it shapes the way uh, that I teach uh, every day and every quarter and every year in, in every situation and it's who I am as a teacher. Um, this one is too small to read but it, it, it uncovers some of the infrastructure that we use at uh, in the tortoise community of practice. This is a snapshot of our campfire uh, live, uh, live chat room. It's not only a live chat room, but it's also an asynchronous archived searchable database of all our dialogues of the last seven to 10 years. Um, and so this is an example, if you go to the search bar and you type in the word kata, which we use like a martial artist uses kata to describe a standard pattern of behavior that teaches important principles. So some of our trading patterns are drills. And so kata two is how we uh, apply uh, drill to uh, trade bull markets that have rising lows and rising highs, and we want to buy on dips in an organized, systematic way. Well, the rules for that fit on one page with a snapshot of what the entry looks like and how to manage it, and that whole process, that whole pattern is uh, kata two, um, the re-entry at the supported spring crossing and the supported fall crossing uh, technical patterns that we've named. Uh, so if a person wanted to find out what we think kata means, I can type kata in and then every reference to kata uh, to include snapshots and screenshots, as you see there, uh, shows up with uh, easy link. So there's a powerful uh, uh, seven plus year database of this uh, trader to trader engagement that is part of our uh, learning environment. That's what the daily practice looks like. Here's an example of the power of language. Uh, one of the lessons from our hybrid trading course this year was the importance of words and self-talk and the way that shapes opportunities or creates blind spots. And so we call this the one-step drill and I just want you to imagine what this might feel like. So if I start with the top line and I ask you to think about what's your biggest challenge right now I'd actually like you to think about this in your head as we go. Feel what your biggest challenge is. Now I've underlined the word your because we're going to change one word in that sentence. And I want you to feel how that one change of one single word in one single sentence changes the context entirely. So I'm going to ask you to think about what's your biggest challenge. And now I'm going to ask you to substitute some people's for yours. I want you to think about other people, you know, other traders that you talk to and work with. What's some people's biggest challenge? What's their biggest challenge? Look at the difference in how that feels. Your biggest challenge is an internal thing. It, there's a lot of emotions to it. When I ask you to think about someone else's biggest challenge, you can bring your rational mind and you can observe and describe and start thinking about rational ways to help them. So now I want you to change the word biggest to next. So not necessarily the biggest, it's just what's the next thing they have to do to make progress. So what's some people's 
next challenge? If you had to give them advice, what was the one thing that you tell them that they should do next to help them make progress to do first things first? Now I want to change uh, the word challenge to opportunity. Now, when you think about that person, what's that person's next opportunity? Um, and so it's not just a challenge, but maybe this is something easy they could pick up and just get going. Not even a challenge, it's just a piece of free chicken that, uh, that will help them along the way. Now I want you to change the word what to when. When is that person's next opportunity likely to arise? And when you look at their situation, you realize it's already there, just waiting to be picked up if they could just see it as an opportunity. That means they gotta be mindful. They gotta see what's there. They gotta realize how easy it is to pick up and incorporate at low risk. So when is that next opportunity going to appear? Now I want you to shift that back to yourself. Now replace that person that you were thinking about back to yourself and just take a quick fresh look around you and say, when is your next opportunity? And now you can make the translation in your mind to realize just how many things there are that you can do in a low risk way right now that can help improve your situation one step. So when is your next opportunity? It's right now. Now let's change that uh, to what is your next opportunity? Of all of the things that there are to do right now, what's the next thing that's maybe the easiest to pick up that you can make progress with right now? So just pick one of them. It doesn't even matter which one it is. Just pick one and let's go. Make the change, lock it in, add it to your repertoire, make it normal, and then ratchet yourself up to excellence. Well, if we spent 30 minutes on this and took some extra time and sketched it out and you talked with your trading and accountability partner, you would have half a dozen things that you realize now that you could do today, this week, this month, uh, that would make measurable improvements in your trading practice at little to no risk. So this is the idea of reframing one step at a time the way you think about your situation, think about yourself, and you think about reward, risk, opportunity, and time. And with simple changes in self-talk, we can change our whole attitude about the work that we're doing and the opportunities that we see. And so the use of words in dialogue reveal deep connections to who we are as people and as traders. And they are gen they truly are the window to the soul. And we can make powerful use of our language to reshape our reality quickly and effectively. Uh, I wanna shift to, this is, uh, this is my favorite pattern right here. There, uh, this happened to be uh, the Dow 30 Industrials ETF DIA. It was in a downward trend. The price had pinched together. You see the two outside red lines. Those are the Z3 lines. Those are three standard deviation Bollinger Bands using our parameters. And price had pinched to a compressed zone, so compressed that we were interested and we framed this trade in both directions. It happened to violate that envelope to the downside, the red dot. The next two bars uh, made a powerful move in that direction that was not surprising. It was normal. And we used our stop, uh, which was a, which started off as the green line at the, uh, the PSAR dots. That was our initial risk. So short at the red dot, initial risk at the green line. It makes two moves in our direction. We take that time, that moment, to move our risk to no lose plus dinner for two. And that's what the new green line shows. And now I have removed the risk to my seed capital. And now it, the worst thing that happens is this thing reverses, hits my stop, and I make enough money to take my wife to dinner in Kansas, which is a hundred bucks. So the psychological shift from initial risk to my seed capital, and two bars later, I'm at no lose plus dinner for two. For, now that now for me, I don't know about you, 
But for me, that's a really significant psychological shift because from this point onward, the worst thing that happens is that I make some money. And now it simply becomes psychologically a science project for me to see how well my rules are going to extract money from this opportunity. And so the intersection of our management rules and the environmental conditions of the trade are gonna determine what the results of that science project are. I've taken my ego out of it. I've taken my risk out of it. My emotional state is calm and measured. And so I look to replicate this pattern, this mindset, this psychological state, this conversion of my psychology from a risk trader to a uh, disinterested scientist, a craftsman doing the same thing over and over again. That's the psychological shift that allows me to, um, uh, to take the next thousand or 10,000 steps. Yeah, well, you know, in, in Kansas, a hundred bucks includes tip and round trip gas and then, uh, you know, probably a little dessert. Maybe I got to bring something home for the kids because they'll, they will demand some food. Well, here's another standard pattern. This is one where the initial red dot and then the reinforcing red dot were two nice entries in standard way that uh, unfolded in our direction for a really powerful move. And the first green dot was our exit to cash the gains from the first two. And the second green dot was the immediate stop and reverse because it hit all of the uh, triggers for our supported spring crossing trade. And then it moved up a certain distance, rolled over, and we took a logical exit in the way we normally trade it. Now, we, you see that yellow box with a green arrow and a red arrow. As soon as we take that exit, we've automatically reframed this, uh, this trade to be ready to go in either direction from a critical state. So what we look for are critical states, and that's defined as a condition in which we are entitled to uh, believe that a larger than normal move could happen in a shorter than normal period of time in either direction in a routine reliable way. So we've identified a number of those critical states and we look for those patterns. And when we see a critical state that we know, we put the appropriate frame on it we frame that trade and then we manage it according to standard work. This happens to be an example of about four critical states. The first red dot was a collapsing dragon pattern after a lower high and it violates the previous low were entered. Then after that, uh, the second pattern is a combination of a collapsing dragon and a Z3 pinch breakdown. Uh, it not only, um, is a reinforcing pattern. It can also be a standalone pattern. Um, the green dot for exiting was a normal uh, sniper exit for us. And the second green dot was the supported spring crossing pattern. And then this uh, red dot is kata two. What do you do when you've had that first retracement that hasn't gone all the way back to the volume weighted average price, which is the orange line? And you have the possibility of a strong move in the short term in either direction is completely logical and expectable. So how do we frame that to not have a directional bias, but be able to follow price and take the trade that it wants in a risk managed way? That's what hybrid trading, that's what critical state visual trading, that's what day trading looks like. If these were daily bars, that would be a swing trade. If those were weekly bars, that would be a swing trade. If it was a 30 minute, 10 minute, five minute, one minute, it would be, a sw it would be an intraday trade. Uh, and the reason that's important is because we are using patterns that are fractal across timeframes. And so the standard site picture that you get, the standard view of the setup is identical regardless of the time frame that you're using. So the time frame simply helps us uh, calibrate the amount of time that it takes to make a decision or the amount of time that it takes for a trade to unfold. So one of the advantages of, of our approach to trading is the use of standard patterns, standard work that are fractal and robust across different time frames, whether it's one minute charts or monthly charts, 
the interpretation of the setup, the interpretation of the frame, the decision making is all triggered by standard uh, indicators. Here's an example, you, easier to see in the slides, our um, a standard pattern of the OWL has six setup criteria. This one shows that it works in both directions. I have uh, hundreds of case studies that narrate these. So this is an example of a standard pattern that works uh, on the way up, on the way down, and can be applied in every time frame. And the details are there for you to study the pattern if you're interested. This is a conceptual diagram that expresses our beliefs about price volatility and why we are interested in the pinch. The pinch is a period of price volatility has become abnormally compressed. And the significance is that when you get sideways price action and a lack of volatility, you can identify a pinch box that allows you to frame a trade in either direction, which sometimes will work directly it leaves the pinch box and off it goes. And other times uh, it will fake one and go two. That's the second diagram where it started with a Z3 pinch breakout and then it uh, reverts and crosses the pinch box and goes in a large move to the downside. So those are the two standard ways in which um, the pinch box is traded in sideways quiet channeling markets. This On the right hand side of the T diagram you see swing position and time frame considerations and the, I turn this into about an hour long lesson that describes what we mean by abnormally compressed price volatility. It essentially means that we look back the last 180 periods and we find uh, the minimum volatility moments and we we find the average and so we say a abnormally compressed volatility is when it's more than one standard deviation uh, below that long-term average. It's exceptionally pinched compared to the last 180 periods, whether that's 180 minutes or 180 days. So we have a very precise mathematical statistics-based definition of what we mean by abnormally pinched. And that is common practice for all of the uh, patterns that we use and the definitions that we use, that we use descriptive statistics in a simple way, but a powerful way to ensure that we are adaptive to changing market conditions and that we have a precise mechanical programmable definition of the setup conditions that, that we use to trigger our patterns. So that's an example of one of those lessons um, concerning price volatility. This is another one where we use moving regression lines, the least squares moving average from different time frames, the 10 period, 30 period, 90 period, and 270 period. These are fractal moving regression lines, which are an improved form of simple moving averages, much more adaptive and very useful. And this allows us to have a fractal view of price movement across multiple time frames on a single chart. So a 10 period regression line is what we call the smoothed price. A 30 period regression line is three times longer and that is the health of the market. You multiply that by three, you get a 90 period regression line. That's the health of the market on the next higher time frame. So if I'm looking at a daily chart using the 10 and the 30, the 90 shows me what that would look like if I went up to a weekly chart. But by putting it on a 90, I can actually see it on the same chart now I don't have to flip between charts and my cognitive load is reduced. And then if I multiply 90 by three, I get 270. The 270 period regression line is what price looks like uh, 30 time frames higher. Uh, and so I can actually use that as an estimate of long-term fair value uh, and compare that to the current price. And then if there's a difference between short-term traders price reflected in the 10, and the long-term buy and holders estimate of fair value reflected by the 270, the difference in that opinion is what creates the tradable moment. It's either gonna to revert to the mean or the shorter term deviation from the trend is gonna become the new normal. So we can use the distances between regression lines to find opportunities to frame trades in a unique way. I don't see anybody else doing that in the world. And this fresh statistically based insight 
has been a very powerful tool for finding opportunities and then projecting the size of possible moves after we take uh, after we take our entries because it turns out that traders have a certain amount of power to move price away from fair value and the strength of that move in one direction is often symmetrical. So when it reverts and goes the other way, that's how far beyond fair value they can get when they go the other way. And that's been an uncanny, uh, reliable way to estimate the size of potential moves, which we can then use as part of our uh, exit strategy and our management strategy and framing opportunities. So more use of simple descriptive statistics to give us a comprehensive, adaptive, robust uh, view of the world on our dashboard. This is a snapshot of the uh, supported spring crossing kata and how we frame trades to get uh, two to one and possibly three to one reward to risk. It's a standard site picture. It's the first pattern that I teach uh, and um, it is fractal in every dimension. If there was only one pattern that I could trade for the next 30 years, I'd pick this one and just live with it. Um, it's that good. Um, this is an example of a constructed storyboard where we were explaining some of the principles of the supported spring crossing and the kata two, and we built this in a lecture storyboard form, and the end result becomes a set of notes that trigger um, the the teachings along the way. I'm not going to cover it now, but what we do is we we narrate those, we record those, we provide the one page snapshot so you can always see the whole lesson on one screen, and that acts like a cave painting for my primitive mind to help me recall the essential principles. And we build our uh, teachings in small bite sized chunks, drill at a time, pattern at a time, and then connect them into a larger ecosystem. Um, this is an example of the trading process questions that we ask. So when we are framing a trade, we frame it in both directions. And when we answer all of these questions, what we discover is that we have taken our emotionality and our bias out of it because we've looked at the trade frame in both directions. We've identified every important decision that we are going to have to make from entry to management to exit to re-entry, to reversal. We've answered that before we ever got into the trade when we didn't have emotionality connection to it. So we've already rehearsed the standard play in every direction. Uh, and then that's what we call a trade frame. Uh, on the left-hand side, what part of price movement is for me is an example of a bite-sized essay that causes us to think in a deep way and reflect on our beliefs about trading. The Gemba is the Japanese name for the workshop where all work is done. The Gemba is where you create value. And when you go to the Gemba, when you go to the workshop, when you go to the trading room, when you're working your trade frame on your work site, you're not just walking around. You are going there with seven principles that help you structure that experience, that work effort into reliable uh, value creation by treating things as a science project, a hypothesis, questions, experience and feedback, taking notes, uh, leveraging schedules and routines, and you nest your principles and processes into a larger process. And then you teach other people what you do in the true story circle. And by teaching what you do to others, you improve your own understanding. That's what we mean by the principles of communication, transparency, and trust. You're not just wandering around. You're there with an intention to improve your practice while you're practicing. And so this is an example of the Shingo model of excellence in practice. Uh, there was a question that said, uh, are the patterns tradable in different instruments? Yes, they are. It turns out that when you have targets that are being traded by humans who are subject to fear and greed and emotion, uh, it turns out that the patterns that those targets make are statistically describable and the statistics we put on them help us find the difference between normal and abnormal. So these are fractal, not only in time, but also fractal with respect to 
um, different instruments. So they work with currencies, commodities, ETFs, individual stocks, and, uh, and the market itself. It gives us really powerful ways of understanding things. Um, we teach how do we find the movers. What we want is volatility in the time frame that we're trading in. The volatility gives us an enhanced emotionality on behalf of the herd. When the herd is running, they are very emotional and we wanna find those movers and put them under a statistical lens in order to find those moments of lowest risk, greatest opportunity. Um, and so finding the movers is the way I teach. How do you watch the members of the herd and find the ones that are in the best current position for tradability? So we find what the market is doing, that's the highlighted one. And then we, um, we rank them and, and stack them according to rules. And then we use that to find the best critical states reliably. Um, I've already covered that one. A, this is a standard flashcard of all the katas that we teach and the sequence in which we teach them. We start with the supported spring crossing. Once we've mastered that, we go to the supported fall crossing. Once we've mastered that, we add supported winter crossing in the owl. Then we go through the sideways quiet channel uh, uh, patterns. We add collapsing dragons and emerging dragons. And what you get at the end of this is a series of linked chain tradable patterns that go through a logical life cycle um, in all of these um, in all of these different patterns. So there was a question there about the um, uh, the platforms for the market scanners. Um, we sell a package for uh, TC2000 that fully incorporates all of my swing and day trade patterns in a systematic way put together by Danny Ben Yair, a professional money manager and hedge fund trader and a uh, super trader and a brilliant programmer. Uh, he turned that, he turned all my stuff into a complete package for TC2000, which we sell as a time saving uh, device and which also makes you uh, independent of my info stream for signals. Uh, very powerful package. We have the same package available in TradeStation, uh, but I, uh, fully disclose all of the math and the and the standard indicators we use, so they're easily programmed in Ninja and or whatever your package uh, supports. And every modern trading package can implement the the frame of reference uh, that we use. Um, the expectancy varies based on uh, which patterns you're trading and how often you trade it and what optional rules you're choosing. But all of the patterns are robustly positive expectancy in every time frame in our experience. Um, let me see if, yeah, that's, that's basically everything I wanted to cover. I lost track of time here. My little 30 minutes opening remarks became 50 minutes. So I apologize for that. Um, I'm happy to stay as long as, uh, as you need me to for, um, uh, for questions and answers. Um, what I would, uh, let me, uh, let me answer questions now and um, share with you uh, another screen. Um, yeah. Let's try this. Share screen. Oh, I see the great Jim Carroll there, one of my, one of my advisory members and my, <laughs> on my board of directors and spiritual advisors. Always good to see you. Always good to see Lisa. Hey, uh, maybe the best thing I could do, if it, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind, if I could ambush you, you've been, you have been experiencing the uh, the nightly strategy podcast, and learning to trade these patterns bar by bar in public, under pressure, with full transparency, and yet you're always smiling. So I guess it can't be that painful. Maybe- No, you, it's not. Could you explain a little little bit what the what the learning community feels like from, uh, from an honest broker there? Um, it's very, very open. Um, hi, Ken, anyway. Um, it's very open. Everybody's, you know, they're watching you. It doesn't doesn't feel judgmental at all. It's a very positive learning environment, and you you're very patient when you when you coach us as to kind of what to do when we get off track. You 
you like help us and then you you also tell us why you know why you, you know we could we could do this or we could do this you know and it's just it's just a very positive learning environment okay so uh maybe talk about the difference between uh, trying to learn a system from watching screen uh, slides on a screen and then learning to do it bar by bar in public. Oh, there's what's no that experience. Yeah, what's that experience like? There's actually no comparison. I mean, you know, I've been to, you know, a lot of a lot of classes. I've, I'm in the super trader program. I've been in it for two and a half years now. And so I've seen a lot of a lot of different classes and um, it's very different when you're driving and zoom actually actually makes it a lot better because I don't I I totally think that it's simply me and you in the room and I'm sure there's probably hundreds of other people but I, anyway it doesn't actually bother me but um it's well just, I don't want to I don't want to scare you I don't want to scare you but um some of the bar by bar trade cases that you have been you've been the driver for have been seen a couple thousand times Oh. So there's a couple thousand people it, or it's one person has watched you trade that trade a thousand times. Yeah. Um, don't even, don't even yeah. like tell me all that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So no pressure, no pressure on you, yeah. Lisa. Yeah. No, but um, no, it's, it's a lot different because I feel like it's simply just me and you and I'm, and I'm telling you, I want to, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And, you know, and you're like, okay. And then, you know, we take off because, I don't actually know the right side of the chart because you simply have it covered up. And so I'm simply going by the rules that, that you lay out for us. And the rules yeah. are very simple. Yeah. All of all of your indicators are something that, and I'm not a programmer, that I actually put into TD Ameritrade myself. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't have the fancy package, you know, that, um, that, that Danny so, so graciously did for everybody. But I, I simply trade your system on TD Ameritrade, and I, I couldn't afford yeah. the package at the time. But yeah, anyway, you've probably been through. Uh, you've probably been the driver for about fifty different um, trade cases over the last four months. So starting probably first week of November, we started doing these religiously, okay. um, and all of those are recorded, by the way, and are part of the yeah. lesson package. Uh, and the learning resource. So the replay on those is really powerful. I find going back to those and seeing it again. In fact, that's, I know what some folks do is like Ken Hum, uh, Ken H. Um, he, he, uh, he lives the experience of being in the, in the hot seat yeah. and then, and then trades it the way. And then he goes back and looks at it again and then sees things in a different way when he's yeah. studying his own, uh, decision making, yes, and 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 I got I just have to share what I think was maybe one of the best insights of the last ten years was in a moment in one of those bar by bars, and uh, it was you and Kim were both trading this thing, and it turned into uh, something like a twenty R trade, twenty execution R, where we had that critical state in a super pinch. And it broke out in one direction, and then you guys just kept adding positions to it because the price just kept going, and those are the rules. So you just, and it was managed risk all along the way. And then at the end of the run, we were kind of like emo all emotionally exhausted because it was such an amazing win. It was probably a twenty or thirty hour win intraday. Uh, and then, and now all of a sudden we're out of the trade. And uh, so I asked Ken, I said, well, uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to reframe the trade or you just want to kind of wait and see what happens? And he said, well, I just want to wait and see what happens. And I, I didn't let him do that. It wasn't a planned response, but I said, no, we are going to immediately reframe that trade and say, look, if price started moving, imagine you were just looking at that and you decided to wait and see. And so we started visualizing what that trade would look like if price started moving north. I said, now where on that indicator array would you feel like it was justified to get back in? So we just kind of, we watched the price move up. We said, oh, that's the price what I would feel comfortable entering. So we just put a green line that that's my provisional mechanical entry because something inside me resonated 
or inside Ken or inside you resonated. So we made that the top of the yellow zone. The yellow zone is the zone in which we're not going to take a position. But when it crossed that threshold, that was the mechanical entry. So we made that the top of the box. Then we went to the other side of the trade and said, well, from this critical state where we exited, um, this thing could have easily kept failing. That's why we got out of it when we did, because it was potentially a big loss. Well, that means that there's a potentially big move to the downside. So let's start tracing that price to the downside. You tell me where you feel like you could enter. Uh, then draw the red line there, and then that completes the yellow zone box. That is the zone in which we don't feel compelled to act. That's our emotional feelings about that trade. Once you bracket that, you get that idea out there. That trade frame can then be adjusted based on the skill of your hands, of your head, of your feet, your experience. You basically detach from the feelings of the last trade, you get to the zero state, the act of establishing the new trade frame immediately allows you to set aside all of the emotions from the last trade and to use the energy of that emotion to do the work for the next trade frame. So even though we started emotionally tired, just by going through the steps of trade framing, we were able to turn that into good work. And it was better to do it immediately rather than have no trading plan, watch price move, and then feel triggered into action on the basis of no trade frame. So we learned in that moment that the most important thing that you can do after the moment of exiting is to immediately lock in the next trade frame of how you would re-enter in either direction just to get it out of your head in a professional way and onto the screen and it that becomes protection against that inner chimpanzee that wants to act out of impulse so this is one way that we can use the energy of chimpanzee to say where would you be triggered to get in on the long side or trigger to the short side we can take that energy and use that energy to construct the trade frame. And then the sense of relief of having the next professional frame in place allowed us then to just respond to price as it began to unfold. And with practice, you can create that trade frame for all these patterns in less than a minute. Because we have standard templates and you drop it on, you make the adjustment and then in a minute, you're back in the zero state and you're ready to trade in either direction in a professional way. Yeah. Well, that was such a powerful learning moment that we've reinforced that uh, in every subsequent uh, exercise that we do in the bar by bar. And it may be the most powerful lesson that we learned about craftsmanship, attitude, and, and leveraging the power of the inner monkey with the power of the inner craftsman to create a really positive trading practice. So I wanted to lock that in before I forget. Um, so hey, thank you for sharing that. Um, yes. a, uh, uh, can, if can, there's can other I, questions. Can, yeah, keep going. Keep say going. two things. So yeah. um, at one point, a couple months ago, recently, you, you, had Shah, you had Shahab and I worked together on an exercise. So yeah. we came up with our plan separately. And it was funny how when we put them together, like I was thinking about it one way and Shahab was thinking about it another way. But when you put it together, we both learned from each other. So you also encourage us to learn from each other, not not just, you know, you and I, which was which is a great learning experience, you know, to, to talk to another trader and to see how they see it. And then another thing I want to say that um, when I started with you, I always had trouble with exits. That was my, oh, it's, I mean, who yeah. doesn't have trouble with that, right? Yeah. And so anyway, but your framework, no matter what time frame I'm trading on, whether I'm trading daily, 15 minute, five minute, one minute, monthly, weekly, it doesn't matter. Your time frame, because it's so fractal, and I have so many choices for exit. I mean, it's, yeah. so now, now I know where to exit. It's not like, Oh, I have a feeling 
that it's going yeah. parabolic, you know, or whatever. Yeah. I can see it yeah. on a chart, but then, but there's so many places that I can move my stop up to that will choke it, but not, but be choking it within a within a Bollinger band or a band yeah. or a or regression line type framework, yeah. not a moving average, but a regression. Yeah, line so type. yeah, so you're not being hurtful to the trade, but you are you're firm but fair. There's yeah, a there's yeah, a study yeah, yeah, there's but, a steady hand on it. Yeah. Exactly. But the well, nice thing is yeah. is now I've yeah. I, I have choices of yeah. where to get. Before it was like, oh, it, it looks a little it feels bad and i'm getting out and you you know is trading on emotion right for my exits where are they always emotional and now they're yeah so totally yeah mechanical yeah here's another uh jim carroll asked me hey what are the two or three most common obstacles new traders struggle with and i i would say it's the exit yeah. you know you worry about the entry until you realize oh it doesn't really matter uh the exit really becomes the important um question in my view, the important decision. And here's, so here's a, another a really important insight uh, that came out of our bar by bars. And and we, we look at it this way. In a standard trade, uh, you know, like one that doesn't fail immediately, if it fails immediately, that's actually great because now I can stop and go the other way because I was in a critical state. But you have an entry decision you have a dis the next decision is when do I go to no lose plus dinner for two? When do I start raising the stop? When do I add positions? When do I start? It's up. So you have a series of maybe seven or 10 decisions before you finally decide to get out. Well, it turns out that every decision that you make after the exit is the same decision every time. It's where is the appropriate place to balance reward versus risk in the new context of the trade that has now unfolded. So that's a standard decision that you're going to make using the indicators in the context. So you're making that decision seven out of eight times. If I had eight decisions, one of them was to entry and seven of them were management decisions. So seven out of eight were how to manage the trade. And the last one, was simply the management decision to get out. Well, we're gonna rehearse that decision. That's why you should spend 80% of your time on the exits because the exit decision is really nothing more than a series of management decisions all along the way. And if you treat each and every one of those in a standard way, then you're getting better and better. And then you realize the entry was really just to get started and it doesn't really matter that much as long as your initial frame was good. Either either way this trade goes is going to be fine. And then the stop and reverse is fine because you're in a critical state. So the essence is understand how to manage the trade incrementally. And then the final decision is the exit. So now let me fast forward to the, the single biggest challenge I see people have with the exit decision. And that is I have a, I have a win in hand. And this thing is going well. And I, how much room do I give it and yet still be able to preserve this abnormal gain that I have? How do I make that trade-off decision? Should I be aggressive or should I be conservative? Well, if you think back to your, all of your previous trading experiences, the ones you remember are all the ones that you got wrong because that's the way the monkey mind works. You'll forget all the times that you chose correctly. So you can only remember. And then if you've been doing this for a while, you can remember all the times that you got out too soon and all the times that you got out too late and you, and now you're on the horns to that dilemma. So one of the ways that we solve that, I think elegantly and eliminated all of the angst was to say, I'm going to take half the position off using my aggressive sniper strategy, which listens to the monkey mind and the fear and greed. And I'm going to have that pegged to a decision rule, which captures more of the open game. And then I'm going to have a conservative rule that uses something like the Bollinger Band mean, which is the reversion to the mean. And that's really the signal that says this outsized gain is over. So I'm just going to put half 
of the exit with the manager and half the position with my sniper. And then the average exit that I get is a perfect blend of the conservative and the aggressive. So I'm getting the blended exit, but I have zero angst because I've already committed in my mind to execute the sniper and execute the manager exit. There's no cognitive load. I've already decided where that exit's going to be. And now if the sniper gets out, but the manager is still all in and we get re-entry conditions, I can put half the position back on using a simple re-entry strategy. It's like a sniper entry. And now I've got my full position back on, but I respected the sniper's sense of danger and opportunity. And I respected the managerial patience. I got the average exit and I have eliminated all of the cognitive load of managing the exit. That's what drains your emotional batteries. That's what makes it hard to consistently trade in a standard way multiple times. That's what depletes your energy sources, right? So that was an important discovery of this COVID year. I see another one here that says, um, hey, could I explain the difference between TQN and SQN? So SQN is the system quality number. And that is the that's the evaluation or the assessment of the robotic implementation of mechanical trading. So if you took your discretion completely out of your rule set and you had a perfectly programmed robot trade that system correctly without error, that system would achieve results. And those results, if you have a large enough sample size, that can be expressed as the system quality number. That's what it should get. If you introduce trader discretion, like I described with this, the sniper and the manager, if I have added my discretion into that system, what I'm going to do is compare my results after applying discretion to the same trade set that the robot got traded perfectly, robotically. If after 30 or 50 trades, if my trader discretion is adding value, then I should have a better um, equity curve. But if my discretion is bad, I will underperform. So trader quality number is the difference between system quality number of the robot and the results that you got once you added discretion. Now, you could be a maniac gambler like Lisa and just do whatever you want, or you could be a systematic, careful trader like Lisa when she's being a manager. So whatever form your discretion takes, you wanna compare the effect of your decision-making compared to the robot. If you have a positive trader quality number, then you should keep doing that. If you have a negative trader quality number, you should stop doing that. You should know what your trader quality number is for every system in every time frame, so that you know if your judgment is adding value or not adding value. The only way you can do that is to have bulletproof rules that can be traded by a robot a large enough sample size to create a statistically significant data set and then documented evidence of where your judgment was applied so that you can go back and look at all of the results in a systematic way. You cannot trust your memory to do that because you'll only remember the good ones and the bad ones you will say, yeah, but there were other reasons why that wasn't really my fault. No, it's, it's, all, it's all your fault. So in a nutshell, that TQN is the trader quality number, which reflects the value add or delete or decay that you add as a result of your judgment. Um, and so we teach how to do that as part of the plan, prepare, execute, and assess process. You know, the plan just has to be good enough to get you into a critical state. 
the preparation was all the trade framing that you did in order to make this a, a safe way to trade. That's much more important than the plan. And then execution is simply trading the frame according to your rules and then documenting your results and documenting the decisions you made if you use discretion. And that's, that's, that should be simplified, easy, craft work, you know, cognitive load is low, follow the rules. And then the assessment, if you still survive all of that, and you will because you're using money management and position sizing to ensure that no single trade, no series of 20 trades in a row ever kicks you out of the game. That's what proper position sizing means. So that gives you the time and space to be able to assess the results. And so assessment is actually more important than any of the other ones, because that's the opportunity to learn from the evidence that you created from your well-prepared trade. That takes a systematic mindset. And so that's why I teach the Shingo model of excellence, statistical process control, emotional state management, ecosystem body of knowledge, learning how to find that area in which you have an advantage and then how to exploit that in a systematic robust way. So that's what I want to say about that. So the two or three common obstacles, okay, so it's the exits, it's finding your edge, it's emotional state management, and it's doing the work with a trading accountability partner in public that documents your commitment to improvement. If you do those four things, then the rest of it is easy. And when I say easy, I mean it's hard, but it's easy compared to those four things. Let me see if there's any other uh, questions that, um, let's see. Um, uh, when are the online classes scheduled? Uh, I, I'm going to start in the first week. I should say something about that. First week of, yeah, I, I got about 10 minutes. Yeah, I'll be, I'm sorry. Duty calls. Um, I told them I was going to be done at 12 and they listened to me. Unbelievable. Uh, so uh, the way I'm going to run these courses is uh, I'm going to teach a day trading, swing trading, and a hybrid trading course where we put all these things together. Now the patterns are fractal, uh, but there's special application just for day trading and there's special application just for swing trading. And then hybrid trading teaches you how to blend those two time frames in a really powerful way. The foundations course is going to be some of these supportive course, like on the psychology and the systematic and the you know, the indicators and some of that's the record keeping that supports all of the trading in all of the time frames. So I've got all the lectures for all those courses already completed. And those are part, those will be part of the course. And you just listen to the lectures on your time that week. I will do a live lecture each week also, just to keep it most current and connected to the, um, to the current markets. Um, and those are recorded. And every weekend I will do a recorded Q&A session for any questions that come out of any of the students from the lessons that week. So it's, it's uh, I, I'll publish the schedule when I do the lectures so you can listen to them live, but you can also listen to them recorded and you send me the questions and I'll answer them and record those answers and that all becomes part of the um, part of the uh, of the coursework. So it's really as flexible as it can be. The single biggest uh, hint that I can give you is you really want to partner with two or three other people, not more than four in a group. Two is okay. Three is probably better. Four is the maximum I think that you want in a learning group to get the best effect because you get a lot of exposure and crosstalk. It's the peer teaching and the communication back and forth that really develops a powerful mastermind effect to learn this material 
in a useful way. Um, and so everybody that's in those courses is going to have access to the nightly strategy podcasts anyway. And you may end up asking a question on Monday that I answer Monday night and which becomes part of the Q and a session for Saturday. So the, the nightly strategy podcast not only covers the reports and finding entries and talks about sample swing and day trading, but it's a chance to talk about uh, important topics that are on everybody's mind. So that's part of the, you know, like the open lab, if you will. Um, so hopefully that, that answers that question. We'll start formally in the first week of April. Um, you, can, you can certainly take these courses on your own at your own speed. I have a bunch of pre-recorded courses already. So if you wanted to just accelerate and go, you could do that too. You don't have to wait for the weekly lecture. You can actually get further ahead. And it all depends on how much time uh, you have available to commit to it, what your learning style is. Um, so I've tried to make this as uh, flexible as possible. The, the main thing that I would say is that you get in there, find a pattern like the supported spring crossing, start practicing and doing it right away and learn what it feels like. And then ask those questions from the doing instead of waiting to try to encompass all of the learning in one big package and then implement, I just start, start going right away. That's how my grandfather taught me to will. He said, here's a stick, here's a knife. This is the sharp end, cut away from your hand so you don't cut off your thumb. And then he held up his hand where he had lost a fingertip to, in a machine accident because he wasn't mindful. He says, don't do that. Uh, and I, that's how I learned how to whittle. So I believe in learning by doing. I believe that the things that you can do are the things that you know. If you know it but can't do it, do you know it? And in a performance activity like trading, it's what you can do uh, that really matters at the end of the day. So I've sort of structured this um, uh, in that way. So. Uh, there was a question, um, is the idea of letting one profits run relevant for day trading? Yes. The way I say that is, what is your average win to your average loss? Uh, if that's better, that's really, you're letting your, your gains <coughs> run. The other way that appears in day trading is to say, uh, how far did I let this go before I got out after after it pulled back. And, and I would just say, um, did you get out because of a statistically significant reason? Because it moved a statistically significant, well, how far it ran was its decision, not yours. You didn't decide how far that was gonna go. You can only let it run as far as it's going to go. What you should worry about is how do I balance that reward to risk on the way up? And if the, if the profits aren't running, what are you going to do? Change your exit strategy and now suddenly stay in longer on a trade that's working against you because you have some conceptual belief that you got to let it run? I think that's stupid. Well, it's stupid only if you don't know that's a bad idea and you keep doing it. So let's not be stupid. Let's be in a position so that if it runs in our direction, that we have a measured way to lock in pieces of the move. And when it decides to reverse and get out, that was its decision, not ours. Our position was where we decided we were gonna get out because the reward to risk was no longer favorable. So that's what I think about letting your profits run. Now, over a large period of trades, when you look at the average win to the average loss, you can, have some judgment about whether your trade rules are allowing winning trades to progress. Uh, and then as long as we have a re-entry criteria, we can fully exploit the large moves. Um, let's see, if, if one has to do multiple trades for day trading, how many trades per day is typical for a day? Um, if you're using one minute trades and you have the emotional bank account to stay in the zero state and keep going, you can trade our style 20 or 30 times a day without much challenge. Um, 
if you're using 30 minute or hourly charts, it might be two or three trades. It, it could be two or three trades and maybe up to 10 because that many things are running. Uh, and on the one minute charts, uh, normal for me is anywhere from 20 to 40 in, in the normal course of events. Each one traded in the same way. So you playing 20 hands of cards, same level of emotional commitment. Each hand doesn't drain me. Each It's just see the cards, I play them or I don't play them, make a decision, move on. So I'm always prepared. I'm prepared to trade 100 times a day uh, over a seven hour period and not be surprised. So, uh, so there's that one. Um, I think I've answered all of those questions that are um, oh, the next challenge in this, uh, when to add positions and when to exit positions, that's all part of the, the best thing I can say is uh, those bar by bar exercises that we do fully take that into account. The practice of when to add a second position, we make that part of the initial trade frame. That if this thing moves out in the usual way, that's the place where if it gets there, I should be adding a position. And we're going to do that during preparation. We're not going to wait to be in the trade and emotionally committed and then try to think in the middle of a trade. That's like trying to get on a bucking Bronco and decide in the middle of it is, is this really a good idea? You should have answered that question before you ever got on the horse. You know, how do I get on the horse? How do I get off the horse when he's trying to kill me, you know, or a bull rider? Let's have that already figured out. So I have drilled the decision making, and I'm not trying to think about it in the middle of the trade. I want to do all my thinking in planning and preparing. When I'm executing, I want to be not thinking. I want to have no mind. I want to be executing. And then I'll think when I assess. Okay. So that's everything I want to say on that one. I think that is, um, those were all the posted questions. Uh, if you have, if you're in the sound of my voice, you have other questions, just send them to me in writing. You see my, my email was on that cover page, long ke at Yahoo, or send them to VTI, they'll compile them and send them to me. And I'm happy to answer those questions. It's gives me something to talk about on the nightly podcast, to be honest. <laughs> oh, that's the other thing I think we should say. When you post your trade frames in the chat room, I'll talk about them and analyze them and you'll get feedback from everybody else. That's the single biggest thing you can do to lock in success is to post your work and ask for feedback because you'll get it. Um, there was a question from Aditya. Is there any such thing as a perfect entry? I don't know. It's good enough. If I, perfect, I would say, is I followed the rules and got in exactly when, I'm, when the rules say that's perfect entry. Otherwise, a a good enough entry is good. Don't let the best be the enemy of the good. Uh, random entries, I would say the way we trade, the way we frame the critical state, we have what we call the minimum manageable risk box. So you have a equal probability of a large move in either direction. So you give the coin flip to the price. So that's the coin flip. So I would say we're taking a random entry, but I framed it so that whether it's heads or tails, I'm in. So to me that you can't get an easier entry than that is because you flip the price flips a coin and goes in either direction. And then everything after that is managing the position. So uh, I can't know the time when it's going to break out, but I know if it's in a sideways quiet channel that is in the super pinch, uh, I'll let price decide. You tell me when I enter. Surprise me into the entry. And then my job is just to manage the trade, get my risk out, and then follow the rules. That to me, a perfect entry is one I don't even have to think about. So that's a shift in mentality. There's really... It is a holy grail idea to try to decide that you can infer from the set of conditions in the market which direction it's going to go and when. I mean, 
you start counting up the number of variables that are moving the market around in all the different time frames where people are making decisions, slinging hundreds of billions of dollars around at the same time, and you think that we can infer what is the magic bullet for the perfect entry? Man, oh man, oh man. Have I got a bridge that I can sell you? Do I trade all the 37 strategies or a selection? I, I trade the next pattern that I see. Uh, my preference on which patterns to trade were on that one slide where I showed the katas. The supported spring crossing is my favorite, except for the Z3P and super pinch. The super pinch is like an acorn of an oak tree where every regression line has collapsed into the same price so that every trader on every time frame thinks the current price is the fair value and the volatility is compressed to abnormally low. It's either going to stay there forever or traders are going to start moving it and then persuade other people with momentum. So the Z3 pinch or the super pinch is my favorite pattern. I will trade that one first. And then the supported spring crossing happens after one strong directional move that started to hint at a reversal is a critical state. And I'll trade those two forever on every time frame. And then the other patterns simply are additive and a little more detailed, a little more context. But those two, I can teach you how to trade those in an hour and how to find them. It'll take three months to convince you, but that's what doing due diligence is, you know. But I start, I would say, hey, start trading it with one share live a hundred times. So you got a dollar of risk. You trade a hundred, so you put a hundred trades on risking a dollar. At the end of a hundred trades, you know if that, if that system is going to work for you or not. Or you could spend, uh, how much does it cost to attend a workshop and then do all the math and all that stuff and then discover, oh, it turns out that doesn't work for me. Uh, actually, you got an idea, trade it with one share live going forward. Trade it a hundred times. Learn from that. And then you'll know if you have a robust idea. I'd say just get on with it. That's also my opinion about backtesting. Backtesting should just help you discover where the anomalies are and what the unusual circumstances are and what the contributions to the gains are over a large period of time. But it doesn't predict anything about the next series of signals or what level of risk that you should take. What should, take, what should teach you about the level of risk to take is the ongoing forward traded live performance with skin in the game under game conditions. That's the only, the only back test I trust is the forward test with live money and skin in the game. And the uh, 37 strategies to document to respond to that other question was simply a way to sort of document the larger ecosystem of beliefs that we've encountered in the uh, larger, maybe the more abstract principles, but always with the connection to decisions that we make. It was a, an effort to get the ecosystem rounded out and to show that there is always something to do, always something to be thinking about uh, from a conceptual philosophical level. Those things render down into the ecosystem. Okay. Um, uh, that feels like we're at a natural, uh, we're at the 90 minute mark. It's, uh, that's what our human attention span is capable of absorbing. That's what one of the recorded lectures might sound like. This one probably is a good, and if you send me the link to this, Jackie, I'll make this lesson number one in the uh, foundations course. Save me the effort of screwing it up later. <laughs> Fair enough. Sounds perfect. Okay, well, thank you all for attending Van Tharp Institute's free Monday webinar and a special thank you to Ken and Lisa. We hope you have a good rest of your day.